Hey, is this where the church group is? Yeah. <laughs> you mean costume party. Um... Uh... I'm just joking, you must be Dave. Oh. Come on in, you're in the right place. <laughs> hey, everybody, this is Dave. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. Oh, of course, thanks, man. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you, too. Oh, nice to meet you. I'm Dave. Nice to meet you. Welcome, everyone, to Prairie Heights. Hey, I want to say welcome to our first-time guests, second-time guests. I want to say welcome to everyone who comes week after week after week to Prairie Heights. This is church family. At Prairie Heights, we are church family, and I'm so excited for the series that we're in. If you weren't here last week, we started a brand new series called Defense, and simply that means that we're taking down the fences in our lives so we can let people in. So we can actually like do things like ask for help <laughs> and we can let people into how we might be really feeling and let them into more than just like, hey, how are you in passing? And what we learned last week, if you weren't here, is we learned at the very beginning of God's word in Genesis 1 and 2, we learned that God designed us for community. God designed us for relationship. God designed us for human connection. And so last week what we talked about is we're not designed to live in solitude, we are designed for community. And so my husband Kyle, he is a proud introvert. And shortly after last week's message, he told me, I'm not so sure I'm gonna return for week two. <laughs> so for the other introverts in the room, I want you to know he showed up and maybe you did too, so way to go. Keep leaning in, and I wanna remind us that it doesn't matter how we are uniquely wired. It doesn't matter if we're introverts or extroverts. This is like innately in us, in our design, this actual need for community. And so I've been so aware and just really sensitive to the topics around, surrounding this. And this last week when an email came through and the subject line was, are you too isolated? My eyes kind of perked up and I'm like, I gotta read that whole thing and it is worth sharing because I think sometimes what we get sucked into is we think isolation just means like physically we're alone, like social isolation. But isolation can look like many other things and so this email was directed from a leadership perspective and so what I want us to recognize though is whether you're uh, leading in the workforce, uh, if you're leading your, at home, your family, uh, if you're breathing, right? Life can just feel really lonely sometimes. But I want us to recognize is that it doesn't have to be. But here are some ways that we can find ourselves in isolation. And so here's four ways that they talked about being in isolation. The first one, you are never with people who are different than you. You are in isolation if you are never with people who are different than you. If all you do is surround yourself with people who are like you, it's not gonna give you an opportunity to live out community the way that God designed us because what happens is we benefit in being uncomfortable and Christian community is a community that's built on Christ, not built on our similarities or our commonalities, it's built on Christ and so when we surround ourselves with people who are different than us, that means it's gonna get a little dicey and a little messy sometimes. And you know what we're gonna do? We're not gonna count on one another, we're gonna count on Christ together in those relationships. And so you might be in isolation if you're never with people who are different than you. You might be in isolation if you never hear the word no. If you never hear the word no. See, if you've built a life for yourself where all you hear is affirmations, all you hear is people saying yes to you, you've chosen shallow community and then get this, and you've surrounded yourself with people who will passively watch you ruin your life. Like, I'm gonna say that again. 
If you are in isolation if you never hear the word no, and what that means is you've surrounded yourself with people who will passively watch you ruin your life. That sounds awful. <laughs> that sounds awful. The third way that you can be in isolation is you don't give yourself to the community. Like that means that you don't give of yourself. It, it might mean that you're really good about encouraging and serving other people, but you don't like really let people in. See, Christian community is an incredible privilege. And with an incredible privilege also comes an incredible responsibility. And so if you don't give yourself to the community, you're playing on the fringes and you're just grabbing at the illusion of community while really remaining in isolation. And so friends, if we aren't encouraging, serving, forgiving, praying for others on a consistent, regular basis, we're in the darkness of isolation. And the last way that you might be in isolation is you never weep for others. You never weep for others. And this might be like a gigantic wake-up call for many of us. Uh, if you would have asked me this even six months ago, when's the last time you wept with somebody because they were hurting? It would have been a while. I had an experience over the summer where I was able to weep with people who were hurting. And it was community and connection and it was something that I experienced that I felt like this is it, like this is what God meant when he said he designed us as humans to be connected to one another because when we don't weep for one another, that means that we're too far away from the people in our life. If we don't really know the hurt that they're experiencing and if we choose not to enter into that, we're missing out. We're missing out, friends. And so today is week number two of our series, Defense, and, and I'm gonna argue this week I'm gonna argue that there is more to this church thing than sitting and coming in a chair or watching online. I'm looking to see what cameras may be looking at me, watching online <laughs> for one hour. There's more to just listening to me teach for 30 minutes. There's more than getting through the traffic and finding a place to park and getting your kids connected into Kid Venture and then making sure that you grab Sandy's donuts on the way home. I want you to know today, and I'm gonna argue that there is so much more than just coming and going for one hour in a week. And maybe the reason that you aren't currently experiencing that more is honestly because you've never had the experience before. Maybe for many of you, that's what church has always been or that's your experience growing up, is that you just come and go for an hour during the week and you just never had a model of what it looks like to be part of a church family where you are intimately connected with a smaller group of people and you knew that you had people there that you could count on no matter what happened in your life. And so the truth for your story might be you've just never, it's not even on your radar to want something that you've just never experienced before. And the reality is, the reality and the truth is that, friends, it is way more comfortable and it is way more convenient to just come and to sit and then to go or to log in wherever you're at and to shut it off than it is to engage. Like, that's just truth. And I, this isn't like a, well, I'm not tossing guilt. I'm just saying... I am saying that there's more. I am saying that there might be more to this whole church family thing. And I also understand that for some of you, you're in a season where it's like, you know, maybe you're married and you got kids and both of you are working jobs and you're caring for your aging parents and then you've added other health concerns on with that. And so you're in a spot where, hey, that is your reality. You're coming and going and, and you're soaking in and you're, you're taking in church family and other people are caring for you. That's great. That's what we're here for together. And some of our stories here today, that's been our only experience, is coming and going. And what I wanna talk about is that the problem with staying there, like forever, 
is you're missing out on connection that you didn't even know you were missing. Like you're missing out on something that you don't even know what it feels like or what it looks like because you've never experienced it anywhere else. And the other truth and the other reality is that the kind of connection and community that God offers us, it isn't available anywhere else but through his church. And it takes a ton of intentionality and it takes a ton of energy and it takes a ton of risk taking to step out and to join in community and connection with other people. And what I'm gonna offer today is a vision. It's a vision for all of us as the Prairie Heights Church family for more. It's a vision that looks more than just standing up and sitting down during a service, but it looks more like sitting in and participating and engaging, being part of, contributing, and through that, standing out as a result of how we live life together. And so today what we're gonna talk about is that we can stand up and sit down, or we can sit in and stand out. We can stand up and sit down and stand up and sit down, or we can sit in and we can stand out. And you know, Jesus understood what it meant to sit in and stand out. See, during one of his last conversations with his disciples, he shared what's called the Great Commission. And when I say the Great Commission, what that simply means, it's sort of like the moments, the last moments that you might have with a loved one. And it's like you know that their days are numbered. And so you're having those real conversations that matter. And they're telling you the last things that they know to tell you of like how they want you to live your life. It's like legacy kind of conversations. And so this is Jesus and he's telling his closest followers, he's like, this is what I want you to do. I'm gonna send you out, I'm gonna commission you out to do something, to make gigantic change in the entire world because that's why Jesus came, is to restore relationship with our heavenly father. And he wanted them to tell the world after he was gone. And so this is what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. He looked at them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He was letting them know like, hey, I've got authority to speak on what I'm about to call you to. Because what I'm about to call you to, it ain't gonna be easy. It's not gonna be convenient. It's not gonna be comfortable. And so he's letting them know, I've got power to speak this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, out of that power, and out of that authority, he didn't say, in your own power, go and do this. He said, out of the power that I've been given. So out of the authority of God and the authority and the power of Jesus, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's a big commissioning. That's a gigantic sending. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all the nations. Do you think maybe they paused for a second and said, you mean everybody? And he's like, yeah, I mean everybody. <laughs> he's saying, I want everybody to know the good news. I want everybody to know who I am and I am calling you to go tell them. I'm calling you to teach and obey, help them to, to learn how to obey my word and to stand in faith. And so this is the commission, this is the sending, this is what Jesus really wanted them to know and here's what he wanted them to do. And he said, surely I'm gonna be with you at the end of that, he said, I'm gonna be with you through all of that. And so you might wonder like, why would this group of people that was with Jesus, why would they continue to be so passionate that today, thousands of years later, we still gather under the authority of Jesus' name as a church family? 
Why would they do that? And it's because of who we believe Jesus is. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God who was sent down from heaven to be with us on earth, to be fully human, to feel what we felt, to experience what we experience, yet to do it without sin. And so he, in that, he was fully God. And so we believe that Jesus fulfilled the mission that God called him to when he died a brutal death on the cross. And then three days later, he rose again. He had victory over sin and death. And after Jesus ascended into heaven, his disciples lived out the commission they were given. His disciples began to realize, oh, that's what he's talking about. Oh, now it's on us to share the message that he shared with us. And think about it, those that were there with him, they saw what Jesus did. And so they were his closest friends and his followers and they were called to share the truth of Jesus and the gospel then spread rapidly. City by city, more people believed and the church began. And so we're gonna read about that in the book of Acts today and we're gonna take a look at the very first church. Like what did it look like right away, right at the beginning? What did the first church look like before there were a million denominations and a million different styles? <laughs> what did it look like in its most authentic form? And what can we learn from that? today. And so as we read about it, we're going to read in Acts, and the purpose of the book of Acts is to give an accurate account of the birth and growth of the Christian church. Luke is the writer. He was a physician. He also wrote one of the Gospels. And so here's a portion of the scripture in Acts 2 that lets us know, like, this is how the people, like, I'll say coveted their relationships and their connection. In Acts 2, 42 through 47, it says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so... What we're gonna spend our time on now is we're, I'm gonna break that out verse by verse. And we're gonna take a look at and go slowly through what the first church experienced, what these people experienced, and to remember that church is and always will be people. Church is people. Church is not someplace that we go. It's a community of people, friends. And this is where we learn that. And as we read how this group of like really passionate people began the first church, what I want you to be thinking about is I want you to pay close attention to what it looked like for them to like sit in. What did it look like for them to participate, to be part of, to engage, to contribute, and to be part of the church because we can stand up and sit down or we can sit in and we can stand out. So let's start back at Acts 2, 42. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. See, can you imagine that at this time, it's like they were getting equipped by Jesus to go out and to share the good news and then all these people started to come to know Jesus and so all these people are new to faith. They've got crowds and crowds and crowds of people who are starting to believe in Jesus. And Jesus isn't there anymore. And so it's on them to teach them. They gotta help these new people who are coming to faith, these new believers. And what happens is, friends, when we are new to faith, we need other people who have been 
a little further along on the journey to help us out to help us out. That's one of the reasons that we do groups here at Prairie Heights, is we want you to be in a group where you're connected to a few people, where you can begin to trust them, begin to let the, the fences of your life fall down, and, and you can let people in. You can find a place where you can be prayed for and cared for. You can learn about God's word. And you can do that with a group of people because here's what these early believers knew because that's their experience is they knew that on their own strength, they couldn't do it. That their life didn't depend on their own strength. That they needed God. And so they devoted themselves to prayer. And before going out into the world, they would go to God first. And here's what they knew. They knew that they needed each other. They knew that it wasn't an option to do the life thing alone. They knew that they needed one another on the journey. See, sitting in looked like together on mission. Together on mission. That this wasn't a solo flight. That the mission and the calling that Jesus gave them was gonna require every single one of them and they needed to be united, and they needed to be together, and they needed to have unity around the mission that Jesus had called them to. So they needed to be in connection and community with one another. Next, in Acts 2, 43, it says, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. See, this was a really unique time, and Jesus and God used that time for, for many wonders and signs to be performed through the apostles so that more people would understand and come to know Jesus. And so today, right, today we might not be multiplying fish and bread, but today, just like back then, there are miracles surrounding us that if we're honest, we probably just count as coincidence or like we give credit to other things but there are everyday miracles happening around us and it happens through changed lives, friends. It happens when families choose to change their family tree. It happens when many of you, you start making being part of a church family a priority in your life because you wanna change your family tree because it's not how you grew up. And so your kids are gonna have a different experience than you had and it's gonna be a game changer for them. That's an everyday miracle, friends. Everyday miracle is when an addict gets clean through the power of Jesus, through the power of Jesus. An everyday miracle happens when a selfish business leader turns into a generous giver by the power of Jesus. That's an everyday miracle. And we can experience that. See, sitting in look like being an example of Jesus. Sitting in look like be allowing Jesus to transform your life and living your life in such a way that other people would look at it with awe and say, what do you, what do you have that I don't? And you don't have to point to your resume or your family history. You get to point to Jesus and say, I've got the power of Jesus. That's what's different. See, sitting in looks like being an example of Jesus. Let's keep going. In Acts 2, 44 through 45, it says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. See, they had this intense feeling, friends, of responsibility toward one another, to care for one another. Like it was just ingrained in them because they knew if they didn't take care of them, who was gonna take care of them? They had this intense feeling of responsibility to just care for one another. Over the last year, I have keep hearing over and over and over again the power of one couple here at Prey Heights. It's the Reno family. And as they started coming to Prairie Heights, they knew they wanted to get connected with other married couples who had younger kids. 
And as they noticed with our groups, there wasn't an option for them. And so they just started their own group. (laughs) They said, there aren't any married couples with young children groups. And they said, okay, well, we'll start our own. And so they started one. And there's people who joined that group. And through that, they've invited coworkers who their lives have now been connected to Jesus through all of you and through being part of our church family. And the people within their group at different times have had significant needs. One couple has two kids who have been in the NICU and there's been other things that have come up in that group where that group has just chosen to care for one another. Those people in that group have had an intense responsibility to just show up for one another. And they are a great example of what it looks like to give and serve and love and care for one another. We want more of that in our church family. See, standing out looks like extreme generosity. When we sit in, the previous two, when we sit in by being together on mission, by being examples of Jesus, What happens is then we begin to stand out because of the generosity that happens. What would it look like in our lives if if you and I just said, okay, I've been given something, whatever that, it might be a material something, it might be a gift, it might be availability in time, you've been given something. And what if you were just, uh, you lived your life in such a way that as you saw needs, you're like, hey, I'm gonna give that. I can give it, so I'm gonna give it. No strings attached. You need that, I have one, here you go. Like it sounds crazy the way that they just shared all their possessions because we would honestly, in our culture, we would call that pretty ridiculous because we take a lot of pride and ownership in our own stuff and our own possessions. What would it look like What would it look like if we turned the tide a little bit more often and said, hey, what's mine is yours because we're family. We're family because we're followers of Jesus and we're gonna be example of that through our extreme generosity and that's gonna stand out. The last one, Acts 2, 46 through 47, it says every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord, I wanna make sure we read this real correctly. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They didn't make it happen. Their faith In Jesus made it happen. God's power changes lives. You and I don't do that. God's sovereignty, God's faithfulness changes lives. See, God knows nothing, friends, of a solitary religion. God knows nothing of a solitary religion. It is not who he is. He did not call us to be solitary in this journey. He called us to do it together so that our lives together would make such a great impact that others would pay attention, that others would notice, that others would see and they would be drawn to it and they would be attracted to it and that's what happened right after Jesus lived and breathed here on this earth, after he was victorious over sin and death and after he ascended into heaven, a group of people were so wild on faith and Holy Spirit power and conviction because they were called on a mission to be sent to go and to make disciples of all nations. See, what happens is when a church of people are following Jesus and living their life in such a way, other people can't help but not like it and like them because it's of God. 
See, a healthy Christian community actually attracts people to Christ. The Jerusalem church's zeal for worship and love was so contagious. A healthy, loving church will grow in numbers. And I just wanna ask us, what are we doing, friends, to make our church be the kind of church that attracts others to Christ? What are we doing as a church family in this together on mission to be so attractional, to draw other people to Jesus Christ, not to draw them to one another, not to draw them to me, not to draw them to the great music, and we have great music, and we're gonna keep having great music. What are we doing, friends, to be attractional, to point people towards Jesus Christ? That's a vision I'm worth giving my life to. That's a vision that I'm, I will give my life to because it's worth it if one more person commits their life to Jesus. Friends, standing out, it, it looks like connecting others to Jesus. And our mission at Prairie Heights, we exist connect, to connect those apart from God with Christ and a church family. And we've got a friend here, and he runs sound. And uh, his name is Jason, and he's been running sound for us for six and a half years. And when he started running sound, he wanted nothing to do with God, and he was very skeptical about this whole church and Jesus thing. But he loved running sound. And he's very good at it. And so, as we all got to know Jason, uh, Jason became a really good friend. And for many years, Many people just love Jason where he's at. Let him ask and gave him a lot of space to ask a lot of questions, to be skeptical in his faith and, and to wonder, like, hey, if this is true and this is true, what does this mean? Um, we gave a, a lot of room for Jason to just be. And along the way, because he's become such a good friend to so many of us, a lot of people just started caring for him and loving him. Like on his birthday, they made him a Star Wars birthday cake because that's his favorite. <laughs> it's like, who does that for adults anymore, right? We should do more of that. Like know what each other likes and show up for each other on days that matter. And people here just kept loving Jason because when you get to know him, he's just such a good dude. And it was several months ago and uh, it was after service And I made my way into the uh, control room and another one of our teammates was back there. And our control room is where they do all their producing and you can see all the screens and the slides and stuff and all the technology. And a teammate was in there just crying. And I was like, are you okay? Like everything going on, are you all right? And he looked at me and he just said, Jason said yes to Jesus today. And we both just sat there and just cried and cried and cried. Six and a half years. And Jason, you're right here and I love you. <laughs> and so it's like to tell your story to our whole church family, like you guys, he's served us well and he keeps serving us well. And through the love of people, he was willing to give Jesus a chance. And I'm telling you, when you say yes to Jesus, friends, that's just the beginning of the journey. That's just the beginning. That doesn't mean that life is full of roses and, and presents with bows on it. That's just the beginning of the journey. And, and uh, Jason, I want you to know, like God's just getting started with you, friend. Love you a whole lot. And God's just getting started with me. And guess what? God's just getting started with you. Because when God's in the mix and when you trust your life to God, anything is possible. Any day, any moment. 
See, friends, we can choose to sit in because sitting in look like together on mission. Sitting in look like being an example of Jesus. And we can, through that, then stand out by being extremely generous and by connecting other people to Jesus. And what if, what if, friends, what if we got to experience just a sliver of what they got to experience back then? I believe it's possible because our God is so faithful. And what if we studied God's word and actually made it the foundation of our life that our truth didn't come from each other's opinions, but the truth came from God's word and his scripture. What if we committed, friends, to to choose community on a regular basis? What if you chose that? What if we had meals together on a regular basis and we laughed so hard until we cried? And we had game nights and we had park dates and we had morning meetings before we had Uh, other board meetings and business meetings, but we had early morning meetings with others so we could just have someone that was gonna pray for us. Like what if we shared what we had in faith, in possessions, in love, in grace, because it came from Jesus and we just shared it all so generously that everybody would look and say, what is up with those people? And we can say, Jesus, a whole lot of Jesus. Because the truth is we need each other. It's not just a want or a desire, friends. Like this is a need. Spiritual connection is a need. Being together and doing something that has purpose beyond our own selfish lives, it's a need. And it's a need that God has called us to and he will bring us through. (laughs) It's why it's so important to connect at Prairie Heights. It's why groups matter at Prairie Heights. And And friends, Sundays are important. This gathering is so important so we can lean on God, so we can worship God through our singing, so we can bring our stuff from the week and just kind of lay it at Jesus' feet, so we can be taught from God's word and we can together feel the unity of the Holy Spirit. Sundays matter. And you know what's even more important? Is that at 2 a.m. or... 10 o'clock at night or six o'clock in the morning, you've got a friend you can call. Who's gonna show up for you? No matter what, no questions asked, they're just gonna show up because they love you because Jesus loves them. And you love them because you love Jesus. See, we can experience only the kind of community and connection that Jesus wants for us under the authority of his house and his church. It's different than other friendships when we're doing it under the authority of Jesus Christ. And so may we stride our way toward that together because this is your church family. The people sitting next to you are your family. The people you walk past and stand in line to are your family. This is it, this is us. And the way that we choose to live our life together will have a dramatic, radical, wonderful impact in the very place that we live, work, and play. And so friends, I'm simply asking, will you just make a commitment to commit to church family in whatever way that might look for you? Will you commit to making a commitment to choose community on a regular basis? Will you commit to committing to just say yes when opportunities arise? Because you wanna sit in 
so together we can stand out. Let me say a prayer for us. God, I thank you for these people that are here today and I thank you, God, for what you're doing right now in our midst. I thank you, God, for your word that is so clear, that helps us have steadiness, that helps us have um, Holy Spirit power, God. Your word is the foundation that we live on and I thank you for people. I thank you for the faces and the stories and the families and the names and the individuals, God, that you are drawing close to you. May you continue to do your work right here, right now through the ministry of Prairie Heights Community Church that we may together unite under one mission, your church, God. This is your church that we get to be a part of. And we thank you so much for that. And we praise you for that. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.